Pandora's box has been opened for better or worse. I think that there's going to be a lot of changes. Some of, going, some of them are going to be fantastically positive, some of them not so much. But I do think that, at least philosophically to me, remote work empowers employees and employers to find the best of each other, regardless of where they're located. And I think that that's generally going to be a net good for society. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Today we look at the future of remote work. Now, you may think you've got it figured out. You spent the last 18 months or so in a remote world. Well, it's about to change even more because we want to make sure that we create an environment that people can excel in. We want to make sure that those people are growing. We want to make sure they're connected to the culture. But we want to also make sure we understand the key aspects of what the future of remote working will be like. Today's guest is co-founder of Time Doctor, Liam Martin. And he talks about some of the interesting pieces to you know, asynchronous work work versus synchronous work and why synchronous work has worked in the past, but it may not be the dominant force inside of our uh, organizations as it has been. We look at different ways that asynchronous work actually works. He talks about the silent meeting, and it really is an important aspect to you understanding what the future of work will look like. You have to change the way you lead people through the future of work. You have to change the way you are intentional, the way you communicate, and it really is important for you to understand all these aspects and the future of your own leadership, not just the future future of remote work. When you think about your own journey as a leader, are you completely clear about how you're up leveling and all of the things that go into you being the best leader you can be for your team? Being an extraordinary leader takes you uh, increasing your skills, it takes you mastering communication, it takes you listening at a different level, it takes you getting a sense of ownership across the projects. There's many aspects to this. This is the core of my work as an executive coach. I'd love to help you and your roadmap to being an extraordinary leader. We do something called Fast Growth Board Room. It's a very special experience with leaders of fast growth companies that want to get together, hang out, do some fun stuff with coaching, with a community, and the content in there is excellent. We help you become an extraordinary leader. If you think you're a fit, just go to fastgrowthboardroom.com and check it out. You can apply. We'll have a conversation. I'd love to get to know you, see if it's a fit. If not, I'd love to give you some free access to others or refer you to others that would help you be the leader that you know you can be. Just go to fastgrowthboardroom.com if you think you're a fit. Now, here's the interview with Leah. Liam, how are you? I'm very good. How are you? I'm excited to talk to you on Growth Think Tank. Yeah, me too. We have been through a lot lately, but before we dive into what we're going to really talk about today, which is remote work and, and what it looks like in the future, I'd love for you to share a little bit about Time Doctor. Sure. So Time Doctor is a time tracking tool for remote employees. Uh, we've been running the company for approximately 10 years, and we are what's called a remote first organization. So we have team members in 43 countries all over the world. We've been doing it for about almost 20 years, actually. And uh, I'm very, very passionate about building and scaling remote teams. So a remote time tracking tool was a natural extension of that. Did you create the tool out of a, your own need or did you see an opportunity out there? So I, before I started this company uh, with my co-founder, Rob, I had an online tutoring company and I was scaling that company quite well right out of grad school. And I found that there was a big problem inside of that model, which was I would build a, bill a student for 10 hours and then the student would come back to me and say, hey, I didn't work with my student for 10 hours or my tutor, I work with them for five. I'd go to the tutor and say, hey, did you work with Jimmy for 10 hours? And they'd say, of course, that's why I billed you for 10 hours. So I'd end up having to re fund the student for five hours and pay the tutor the full 10 hours. And that was really destroying the business. So I needed a tool to be able to very clearly and quantifiably measure how long someone worked on a particular project or task with someone else. And that was really scratching my own itch. I tell anyone that's going to start a business, scratch your own itch because it's going to get really difficult over the next couple of years and you're going to want to quit a lot. But if you have that passion, you're going to be able to get yourself through. Now, I don't know exactly what the product does and we don't have to get into the details of it but does it does it get into do employees resist the fact that because they're getting recorded in some way how does that kind of work with your product to a degree what we like to follow at least internally is a radical transparency mindset so everyone in the company uses time doctor they choose when to turn it on and off so it's a task management tool. And when it's turned off, there's no actual time being tracked, but then everyone knows what everyone else is doing. So right now they know that I'm working on my podcast task, which is inside of my podcast 
podcast project. I compare that to all the other 600 plus podcasts that I've done over the last two years. And then I can start to analyze that data and figure out, well, how long does a podcast actually take? How much does it cost me? And then what's the long-term return on ad spend effectively for this type of task? So it can be used to measure your own time, but ideally it's to measure across the team and the organization, right? It works the best when everyone uses it, even the people that are in charge. We believe that it's not just a top-down approach. It should also be a bottom-up approach. So everyone can see everyone else's data. And then you have that transparency through your organization. Well, Liam, we're going to look at the future of work and specifically remote work. We've been through an incredible time period of change. I think a lot of people, I'm sure you've heard everything in the book where companies said they could never hire remote workers. We don't have that kind of business. We don't, that's not going to work here. Well, we proved that wrong. Almost everyone knows that they can work remotely. Um, at certain jobs, they can't, but especially in the knowledge world, knowledge workers that are expected to think and, and apply and research and do those things. Um, tell us a little bit about the way you see the current world of remote working. So you're right. We went through a massive change. I actually had a dinner with a friend of mine who runs a multi-billion dollar technology company that you would probably know. And he told me, I didn't think we'd ever be able to go remote. And I was completely wrong. And he basically just told me that I was right, which is fantastic. (laughs) For me, whenever a billion dollar tech founder tells you, hey, you were right about going left versus going right. But we've seen the biggest shift in labor since the industrial revolution. 4% of the US workforce was working remotely in February of 2020. And by April of 2020, 46% of the U.S. workforce was working remotely, and 82% of the knowledge workers in the United States were working remotely. And that's effectively what was happening everywhere on planet Earth. And the interesting phenomenon right now is we're still floating around 35% of the U.S. workforce working remotely. I still think that's going to go down a little bit, but we're probably going to end up around 30% of the U.S. workforce working remotely post-COVID, which is a massive shift, effectively an exponential jump from the 4% that it was pre-COVID. I had quite a few people I interviewed on the show through this, um, maybe after they got their feet wet and they, they understood this. I talked to one lawyer specifically and he's like, you know, we used to do a, hire a lot of paralegals and we found out that we could do that offshore and we've changed our entire business model. We will never go back to the way it used to be. And I think a lot of people have seen this breakthrough that they'll never go back to the way it used to be. You probably hear that quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, Pandora's box has been opened for better or worse. I think think that there's going to be a lot of changes. Some of, they're going, some of them are going to be fantastically positive, some of them not so much. But I do think that, at least philosophically to me, remote work empowers employees and employers to find the best of each other, regardless of where they're located. And I think that that's generally going to be a net good for society. And when you think about kind of, I know you, you guys focus on the tools, but you also focus on the data side. I've had quite a few of these conversations where they've said, you know what? I kind of feel like people are more productive. I can't put my finger on it, but I feel like people are able to work more on their own time and and maybe work in their best hours of thinking, which is a very big thing. Like you don't have to work when everyone says work, you do it when you do it the best. Um, What are you seeing from a data side? So you're right. The, The mindset of allowing people to work wherever they want, whenever they want is an important one to take into consideration. There are some legal issues that you have to overcome. So as an example, if your employees are not, are saying that they're U.S. employees, but they're actually working in Indonesia, you'd need something like an employer of record company to be able to work for that or to to solve that problem. But fundamentally, the data shows we actually are working a little bit longer per day than we were in the office. However, when you actually tunnel down into that data, you find that people are spending a lot more time being, I would say, more social or more human outside of the office. So in Instead of taking a half hour lunch break, you might take an hour and a half lunch break. You might walk your dog or walk your kids around. Uh, You might be able to spend more time with your wife or husband or with your family during your work. So it's allowing you to actually have much more human connections with work as opposed to when you go in the office, it's an hour commute in, it's your nine to five, and then it's an hour commute back. Just quite literally saving those two hours of commute time, which is the average commute time in the United States 
creates is huge in terms of your overall productivity, even if you use that simply to sleep. Now, Liam just talked about we're working more hours, but we're also having more social time. Now, I think employees are not going to want to give up a lot of the flexibility that has been created through this. They like the, the no time commuting. They like the fact that they don't have to always dress up or maybe they just dress up from the waist up. Um, they love the flexibility of working on their own time when they do their best work. And it's something you probably should embrace because you want the best of employees. You don't want them to work the hours that are always there. Now, they have to be available for certain meetings and, and certain things. I get that. Sometimes they need to be in the office. Sometimes they need to be, you know, at client sites. But you want to make sure that you create a space that where people can be flexible because some of the best talent out there is going to require flexibility. And it's really an important piece to keeping the best people and hiring the best people. And that's what's important for you as you scale your company. Back to Liam. And when you think about the future of this, like things are going to, to be different than they are today. What do you kind of, uh, what's the vision you have for that? So it's going to be very interesting. There's three separate directions that we're going in. Uh, there is companies like us, which are remote first companies. And then there are people that are going to go back to the office after COVID is over. And then there's going to be hybrid companies. So you're going to go one of those three directions. Right now, the market is approximately 20% of that workforce is going to stay remote. About 10, about 15 to 20% are going to go back to the office. And then 60 to 70% are going to go hybrid. And I think the big critical part is hybrid is kind of a tangential term. Uh, some people may go hybrid and say, you can work from home or you can come into the office, the office is just available to you. Or, hey, you have to actually show up in the office four out of every five days, and maybe on Fridays, you get to go remote. So that's the one that I think is the most interesting. And we're probably going to see over the next 24 months, that number whittled down back into the remote camp and the office camp. And that remains to be seen where we really go. I would, however, say from an economics perspective, the P&Ls for remote first organizations are way more efficient. Efficient. On average, they're about 30% more efficient in terms of labor consumption than an on-premise model or an office model. So I think that that's going to be a really important factor as it applies to this hybrid category, which is by far the largest category of work that we're planning on doing after COVID. Now, there's certain challenges around leading a hybrid organization. Remote first has its challenges as well. Back to the office, you know, source certainly has challenges. But hybrid involves a lot of, you know, how do you handle the staff meeting when you've got three people at home and six people that are in the conference room. And the technology of that is not really that easy. I, I think you, we probably make it harder than it actually is. Um, right. What do you what do you think about the technology of that, uh, the, the, the hybrid in the future? Well, one of, and if we just step back a minute, the question that you asked is kind of putting the cart before the horse. Okay. When you look at a remote organization and even a hybrid organization, there's a different methodology for managing those types of organizations in comparison to office organizations. And it really boils down to synchronous versus asynchronous work. So the biggest problem that I see the vast majority of remote and hybrid teams implementing right now is they're stating, well, we have to do the same amount of meetings that we were doing in the office. And you actually don't. And the reasoning behind that is when everyone pays effectively that two hours to commute into the office every day for that form of collaboration, everyone pays that cost. So therefore, it's kind of like a all-you-can-eat buffet on synchronous collaboration. Remote teams have recognized since we're not paying that cost to be able to commute in every single day, we can afford an a la carte model as it applies to synchronous collaboration. And the vast majority of remote companies that are successful actually reduce the amount of time that they meet with each other. They reduce those synchronous moments of communication as much as possible. And they find that that actually accelerates people to do deep work, i.e. getting the actual things done as opposed to the meetings that you do to get the things done. And those produce much faster growing organizations. So the question is not what kind of technology should we be using to be able to collaborate? It should be number one, how can we minimize collaboration? What forms of collaboration synchronous can we remove in order to accelerate everyone's time and spend, instead of two hours doing deep work, spend six hours doing deep work per day. Now, Liam just talked about synchronous and asynchronous work. Synchronous work is something that we've known 
inside of our workplace for decades where we are doing it together. We're having meetings together. Asynchronous is creating new ways of thinking about how to get things done, new ways to collaborate. And asynchronous is the future of remote work. When you think about what you are really there to do, you want to make sure you create space for people to do their best work. And something I've seen work really well is no meetings on certain days or certain times that allow people to do the deep work. Now, what I mean by this is I had a client of mine who was struggling with, we were we're overwhelmed with meetings. And this is before COVID and whatnot. But I introduced this concept of no meetings, just as kind of a curiosity question. And he embraced it. They ran with it and they had a tremendous amount of uh, benefit from no meeting Wednesdays. Now you can choose any day you want, but no meeting Wednesday meant that no meetings could be scheduled for status updates. They could collaborate, they could work together in, in small teams, but they couldn't have regular executive team meetings, client meetings, or anything else. That was the day reserved to get the work done. Now in the future, that asynchronous approach to deep work will be very important for talented people to perform at their best. And it really will be a game changer if you can embrace that inside your workforce. Back to Liam. You know, I think a lot of people misunderstood this deep work and I, I find it to be incredibly powerful. I'm not a 30 minute kind of, let me just put my thought, my thinking cap on and do 30 minutes. I have to do two or three hours. And when I wrote my book, it was it was three or four hour, hour writing sessions. Are you seeing that this deep work in remote world being able to stick around? So if you take a look at uh, Cal Newport's book, Deep Work, it is to me the absolute guide that everyone should be using to be able to focus all of their employees on achieving the most throughout their workday. A lot of the times, particularly in on-premise organizations, i.e. office organizations, a lot of the mid-level management is really not needed inside a remote organization because you require way less meeting time. You require way less synchronous communication time in order to get what you need done because everything is really reduced to quantitative metrics that are reported asynchronously. So to me, when we look at where we're at right now, I mean, within the next two years, I fully expect there to be a very serious compression in the mid-management layer inside of corporate America. More importantly, I also see the distribution of labor being, I mean, there's going to be a complete renaissance of people that are able to be really, really good at their job at very particular things. And those are the people that are really going to explode inside of these organizations. And the people that are fundamentally just focusing on the communication pace, I guess, of an organization, which is quite a bit, those people will be minimized pretty heavily. Interesting thoughts about the future there. Um, what else could you tell me about the way you see our organization and, and remote working in the future? So when I look at, at least, and if I take an asynchronous view on remote work, one of the biggest things that ceases to be that popular is the charismatic manager. The person who's actually the loudest or the most charismatic during a meeting, their power is wanes significantly. And the more kind of introverted person that's actually a lot more mindful and probably in a vast majority of cases knows more about the subject that can communicate asynchronously, meaning I can write out an email as an example, or I can write a comment on a project management tool that's a lot more insightful. Those are the people that are actually going to grow throughout those organizations in the future. So you're going to lose a lot of the charismatic leader-esque type of individuals that were getting by simply because they were charismatic, not because they actually were valuable to the organization. And the quieter people that are actually quite valuable to the organization, those are the ones that are really going to move up in those orgs. Interesting thought there. And I know charismatic and, um, and some elements of that, we, we've got to have connection and talking with employees. But what you're talking about there is maybe the, the leader that comes into the meetings and said, you know what, I've been thinking about this idea and they've already made their mind up and they're just trying to convince people that this is what they should be doing. And I know there's many elements behind that. When you think about the impact this is going to make across organizations, what do you, what do you see there? Well, I mean, I like to call them the armchair manager, which is someone who has no tactical understanding of what they're talking about, but maybe they look at five or six different departments and they say to themselves, Hey, this is what we should be doing next. As opposed to paying attention to the people that are on the front lines that very well, I mean, whether they agree or disagree, that's where you should really be getting your information from. And asynchronous organizations don't work that way. Uh, asynchronous organizations say, we have an issue. We need to actually figure out the solution to this particular issue. Let's talk about it asynchronously. As an example, writing is a much more valuable skill in an asynchronous organization than it is in a synchronous organization. Because if I'm 
I'm the best person at convincing you in person, that loses almost all of its value when we're talking about asynchronous. Now, there are some times when you have to pop over to a synchronous conversation, particularly if you really can't solve the issue. But the vast majority of time, those armchair managers, when you when they pose those questions or when they say, hey, I've got this idea, a lot of people won't necessarily tell them that they're wrong because they don't either want to get into a fight with their manager or they just don't have the skills to be able to actually tell them what they really need to have done inside of the organization. But when it's async, you can actually think, you can put down your thoughts and you can usually convince people to go other directions. Makes me think about that uh, a few years ago, Amazon came out with no more PowerPoint in meetings. They actually write a brief and so we, read the we brief. do exactly the same thing. <laughs> we literally, uh, so we have, we have, it's called silent meetings basically, which is no presentations are allowed to be presented in a meeting. You collect them on, uh, you fire up Vidyard or Loom, you do your presentation, post that inside of Asana. We use Asana as our project management tool. And then people discuss the main issue. And you also identify through text, what is the main issue that we need to solve? We ID effectively. And you go through that entire process. And then if you can't find a solution to the issue, then you jump to a synchronous meeting to discuss it. But if nothing needs to be discussed and we found a conclusion, then you just add conclusion to the top of the meeting section. And that's it. The meeting is completed. Uh, we get, you know, way more of these done than a synchronous organization. And frankly, another thing that really bugs me about these orgs is there are people that can't rep requisition a paperclip inside of companies. And and yet they can have $800,000 plus employees sit in a meeting for three hours. I sometimes look around at meetings and I say to myself, hmm, this meeting costs me a $6,400. <laughs> it's, it's a bad utilization of their time. If they don't need to be there, they could watch the video at 2x speed and get a lot more work done. Great uh, point there. Let you wrap up this. What else have you learned that applies to these silent meetings that you could share with us today? Generally, it is just that the ability to be able to do your job should fundamentally be reduced down to quantitative measures. And that's the big thing that a lot of people don't want to necessarily confront. Um, obviously, I'm biased because I have a time tracking tool for remote teams, but successful remote organizations have all of their metrics reduced down to quant quantitative measures. So if you can implement that inside of your organization, then you can very quickly identify who is the most valuable people in your organization and give them more resources. And you can figure out who isn't valuable and decrease the amount of resources resources that they receive. This is really to me, a model T moment where you're going to see companies like Coinbase, which IPO'd at $141 billion, entered number 98 on the S&P 500. And for the first time in the history of the SEC, they've been able to state that they their headquarters is nowhere because they said anything else would be a lie. So you're going to see many, many more of these companies. Most of the fastest growing remote tech companies in the world are remote first. And that trend, I think, is going to probably be at 80 to 90% within the next five years. Liam, as we wrap up today, reading between the lines, you wouldn't want to be in uh, class A office class uh, buildings and have a lot of investment in that. Is that true in the future of work? I have uh, put a lot of my money into co-working spaces. Uh, I would probably transition as much as human. If you own a lot of corporate real estate, flip over to co-working spaces. That space about to explode. Love it. Liam, thanks for being here. Thank you. Well, this wraps up an incredible episode of Growth Think Tank. Liam's listening in here, but I really appreciate you uh, uh, sticking around for this recap. When you think about the future of remote work, it's going to be different than it is today. It's probably different than what you imagined and what you worked through the pandemic period. But you know, I think a lot of employees are going to want a flexible working arrangement. They're going to want um, to, to really have their time, work on their best hours. What Liam was sharing with us is a lot of insights around this. I love the silent meeting piece to it. And I really love the fact that he, he really talks about the, the synchronous and asynchronous work and how that will change in the future. Please keep uh, your finger on the pulse of this. If you want to be the best leader you can be, you want to make sure you understand all the aspects of this and how to lead in that remote or hybrid world. And that's really important. If you have any questions about that, just go to genehammett.com. We have a lot of free resources. If you want to be an extraordinary leader, go to Gene Hammett. I'm happy to help you. When you think of growth, you think of leadership, think of growth, think tank. As always, leave the courage. We'll see you next time.